All right. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Uh, you got my message about a minute ago, two minutes ago there. We're just uh, waiting for a few more people to enter in. But uh, we'll get rolling here. I'll introduce myself. So uh, about six weeks ago, Ocean State Signal, uh, Gary and JM there asked me to present on driver feedback. Now, we've been a supplier of theirs. Uh, Traficom is my company or our company. Uh, we've been a supplier of theirs for driver feedback for, I don't know, maybe eight or nine years now. And I've worked closely with them and uh, support now the marketing manager here at Traffic Home. My name is Andy Peterson, and uh, I've been with, with this company for going on eight years now and have seen the ups and downs of driver feedback through the years and believe that we have a very consistent offering that is still relevant in 2020. So this is a product that's been, or a concept that's been on the market or available to roadways for going on 20 years now, maybe a little more based on what you know 3M did years and years ago. And, and at that time, the, uh, Traffic Home was building them for 3M. We then uh, took over the concept from them and, and produce our own products uh, now, our own product line of driver feedback. So we have a lot of experience with, with uh, the history of driver feedback and where they're going in the future. So I don't wanna just give you information of what we've accomplished with them, but also what we plan on doing down the road and what's available right now that, that kind of appeals to uh, a broader market. Um, so, uh, you know, I really want to thank you for, for joining this webinar. I know we're all getting uh, bombarded with invitations to webinars out there. I'm sure you have overlapping ones right now. So I really appreciate that you selected mine to, to, to view and, and hopefully I can equip you with enough knowledge and, and walk away with a good understanding of what driver feedback means in 2020. Okay, so with driver feedback, any driver feedback project, we have some basic ultimate goals, um, especially now that these products have been hashed out and what their usefulness is and where they're useful. Uh, these are the things that we really would like to see in any driver feedback project we put out on the roadway uh, to ensure that the customer is getting the most for their money. They're not uh, expensive by any measure or, you know, compared to other traffic calming measures like uh, chicanes or speed, speed humps. Uh, driver feedback kind of land somewhere at the bottom of cost output, but we do want to make sure that they're going to be effective where we put them. So uh, goals that we have for any, like I said, any driver feedback project are usually going to be to provide supplement to law enforcement. And I'll kind of get into later why that is, but basically you can't put a cop on every corner all day long. And while it is a very effective measure of getting people to slow down, um, it becomes expensive, costly, and almost, and absolutely prohibitive. Whereas with driver feedback, we can strategically place them in places where we know speeding is an issue on an ongoing basis and uh, basically perform the action of a, of a, of a law, or law enforcement in the presence of it. Also, we would generally like to capture traffic data. So we, we have the benefit of uh, traffic counts and traffic reporting off or data reporting off of the signs themselves. Uh, so we'd like to see that as an as a value added component of any driver feedback project and utilize that data down the road um, for maybe improving speed limit thresholds or uh, you know adding law enforcement to a specific zone. Obviously, the big one is to get drivers to slow down. We know speeding is a massive issue. It causes um, a lot of uh, grief on our roadways, and so we want to make sure that. Uh, we are providing the maximum amount of safety we can with these systems. So you, you can uh, ensure that wherever we're installing these systems, they're going to they're going to be useful to the drivers that are that are viewing them, and they're going to heed the warning. Now, there's a kind of a tactic for that, right? So we don't want to just put them out wherever we we think they're going to slow down. We we have a tactic for figuring out where drivers are going to utilize these the best, and I'll get into that later. And finally, we want to be affordable. Traffic calm. We try to build everything as much as possible in-house on American soil. Uh, everything is, in fact, built on American soil within our within our products. Um, but we do want to maintain an, a level of affordability so that we can maximize coverage with a budget. So if you have 20 school zones and you have to pick two, that kind of sucks. <laughs> Whereas, uh, you know, with, with a more affordable product, hopefully you get you get coverage at every at every uh, school zone there. So what problems are we trying to solve? Uh, I kind of did some digging this past week as to, you know, what, what, are, what are other measures accomplishing out on the roadway? And I came up with uh, this study here from uh, 
primarily, primarily Santiago Chaparro, published in 2012. So it is older data, but I think it's still relevant today. Uh, law enforcement has, if they, if they provide a six weeks presence at a specific speed problem area, meaning a, a vehicle out there uh, monitoring traffic and writing tickets as obviously needed or <laughs> as available uh, to speeders, if they provide a six week presence, there is an eight week after effect of that six week presence. Meaning that you get about a total of 14 weeks of slowing down before you have to perform that six weeks again. That's great, that's effective, but it is ongoing, right? And it can't be ever present or omnipresent. <laughs> Uh, also, it was interesting because I was reading through uh, kind of the, the impact of just posted speed limit signs. And according to ITE.org, they have very little impact on drivers' actual speeds. I don't know the actual application of that or how, you know, that's a pretty generic statement, not based on a lot of, uh, you know, study or a research study. But their, their assumption was that you're not reducing speeds that much by putting a different speed limit up there. Generally, we're looking at the 85th percentile is going to be the safe speed of the roadway, and most drivers are going to go that speed. But you do have the problem of there's kind of this concept in, let's just say America, I don't know the rest of the world, but in America that as long as you're going the speed of traffic, you're traveling a safe speed, but that's not true. We know that that results in crashes that result in fatalities. And uh, especially when we're considering pedestrians and cyclists and, and uh, non-motorist road users, um, those, you know, they're, they're, they're susceptible to obviously terrible crashes. And if the, the uh, speed is in excess of the speed limit, we generally see uh, problems there. So our goal, again, trying to get people down below that speed limit, at or below. I think uh, at or below is a, a reasonable goal to have. Now, with, uh, with, dry, with speed feedback signs, radar feedback signs, I should cover. Uh, we call them driver feedback signs in the industry. There's radar speed signs, driver feedback signs, uh, speed feedback signs. Anything pretty much centers around the word feedback and sign. You can lead it with anything you want to. But as long as it dri shows drivers their active speed as they pass the sign, that's what we're talking about here. So you get uh, a 3.6 mile per hour reduction after 12 months. And that was proven in this study, I think over the course of uh, eight months or nine months, I can't recall exactly, it was probably more nine months. Um, the initial effectiveness of the sign was somewhere around eight miles per hour. It was then reduced to about 3.6 miles per hour after 12 months. So that means that everybody on average reduced their speed, whatever their initial speed was, they reduced it by 3.6 miles per hour uh, even ongoing after 12 months. And we have tons of data sets off of our signs. We get calls from our customers all the time asking, you know, how to view their data and how to review it. Uh, may, mainly, you know, like law enforcement uses. So they, that's maybe the first time they've utilized the data off the sign. So we get it all the time since the inception of these signs and we put uh, speed data collection in the signs. We've, we've seen the data coming in off the streets and uh, they have not lost their effectiveness. So we see signs that have been out there two, three, four years, and they're still just as effective as they ever were. And we'll show you a data set uh, later on in the presentation that, that kind of demonstrates that. So the real question is, do they work? You know, a lot of, there is some contention about, uh, are they actually functional now? And I think it comes down to really a good application and use of the system. So, Point number one, uh, they work best for drivers exceeding the speed limit by less than 10 miles an hour. So you're not going to have much of an effect on somebody going more than 45 miles an hour in a 35 mile an hour zone. And the reason for that is that those people generally know that they are exceeding the speed limit and they don't really care. They're, they're doing it intentionally. Uh, where our signs function best is to raise awareness to the driver that is possibly just unaware of their speed or the active speed limit of the roadway. Um, there's, a, there's a great psychological study that came out recently. It's kind of high level, but it just talks about the, the effect of feedback and especially immediate feedback on drivers uh, as they pass one of these signs. So it's kind of plays into the psyche and uh, gives, you know, something that people are hungry for, which is immediate feedback. And that's true on the roadway as much as it is in like your day to day work, right? You want to want to hear that you're doing a good job and that can be as beneficial as, as getting a, a, pay, a pay raise. <laughs> so so we're giving them that type of feedback on the roadway. And uh, for the most part, like I said, you know, everybody going under 10 miles per hour is going to recognize they're going too fast and they'll slow down by that. Let's just say 3.6 mile per hour uh, speed reduction. 
Now there is a limitation on how far these signs will affect speeds. So leading up to the sign, just the flashing sign alone, even if they can't read it, the driver's going to slow down because the sign's flashing at them. So our signs have about a 500 foot radar detection range in front of the sign, but they're effective for about a thousand feet out because of that flashing scenario. So now that's usually when and, and traffic is usually sufficient to the signs flashing most of the time. It's showing drivers their speed most of the time, especially during busy hours. So obviously this is gonna be reduced by about uh, 500 or 400 feet, I'm sorry, 500 feet if there is no vehicle in front of another vehicle. So there's gotta be a sequential uh, traffic presence for this to, to full 1900 feet to play out. But basically if the sign's flashing the drivers, they're gonna see it a thousand feet away and start wondering what's going on and reduce their speeds. It's proven, that, again, same study. The study was focused on how far are we affecting drivers uh, in front of and behind the sign. Oop, sorry. Um, and behind the sign, it was somewhere between 400 and 900 feet of effectiveness after the driver passed the sign. Unfortunately, they begin to speed up again. It's not like they, they reduce their speed, but it is effective. So if we, we calculate that 1,900 feet of effectiveness and we put that in a school zone, that's kind of the general range of a school zone. So that's really highly effective there. Uh, also in the presence of pedestrians, they're highly effective because you can put it you know, preceding a, a crosswalk or maybe a busy area and you're gonna get that 1,900 feet of effectiveness there. Actually, we put it kind of toward the middle of the busy area or toward the middle of the school zone and you're gonna get maximum coverage in front of and behind the sign. Uh, so assuming the average driver is going to slow down preceding the sign and then they're gonna speed up after the sign. So we really wanna nail that zone there. And if there's no reason for drivers to slow down, these signs kind of lose their effectiveness. So if it's out on the open road, out in the middle of nowhere and there's no speed reduction and there's no um, danger or caution, like. Potentially, you could put these in advance of a curve of a curve uh, to get people to slow down advancing into a curve. There's studies that say that it's really effective at slowing drivers preceding a curve. But let's just say it's a straight segment of roadway, rural roadway, which uh, I'm in Idaho, so we have plenty of rural roadways <laughs> without any sort of danger except for a cow walking across the road. Um, you're going to you're really going to limit the effectiveness of that sign. So we don't recommend you put them in those scenarios. You want to be more. Uh, have a reason for drivers to slow down and they will slow down. Uh, again, we continue to improve speeds, improve speeds by reducing speeds uh, beyond 12 months. So we've seen study or, or data set after data set and we are reducing those speeds. We have a great uh, advocate in um, the city of Edmonton up in Alberta, Canada. They have over 200 of our signs on the roadway and they've kind of integrated a, a data collection uh, cloud-based system on all of those signs and they actually publish it online. I think if you go to data.edmonton.com you can see this great map of their complete city. It's all public information. That's kind of one of the goals of it was to show the public they are doing things to reduce speeds and here's the measures they're taking and here's the effectiveness of the sign. So you can actually go into the data set for each sign. They also have summaries of, of the data sets. It's really awesome to see but they've been up there for I think six years now. Uh, operating. They've added signs year after year after year, but the initial project was about six years ago, and those signs are still slowing drivers down in the same spot they've always been uh, six years on. I will say that the driver feedback signs work best when they complement other traffic calming measures. So this may be the presence of law enforcement. In fact, the, the prevailing thought is that if you put one of these signs up and then you put a uh, an officer just south or just just beyond it, uh, you're going to get your maximum effectiveness. People are going to get kind of scared of what's going on there. And that'll be a lasting memory. <laughs> so they will slow their speeds down to avoid a ticket. That's a, you know, a driving factor is, you know, you give them a ticket and they, they want, you know, don't want to pay the money out for it. So they're going to reduce their speeds and in general. Um, so, yeah, so, but also you could add uh, speed humps, uh, roundabout chicanes, you know, these, these, these signs complement those, those, um, efforts and in fact there's studies in seen one, a great one in Seattle where they they compounded traffic calming measures and they really they they met their goals of, of slowing drivers I think to 20 miles per hour in their neighborhoods it might have been as low as 15 in some neighborhoods which is a pretty dramatic result because you can't it's hard to get people to go that slow anywhere so they, they did it with uh, combinations of, of, of solutions and driver feedback was in that mix so again, just can't reiterate enough, be thoughtful in the design and placement of these. Don't just put them up anywhere. 
It's got to be a driving factor. And pretty much you can assume if there's a reason to get people to slow down there, it's effective to put uh, traffic calming measures there. So what are the best use scenarios? Um, <laughs> top one, where excessive speed presents a discrete danger. So you're going to want to make sure, you know, if there's like curves, you know, going into a curve, if you're going in too fast, you're going to slide right off the edge of the road. And we don't know what danger that presents in a specific scenario, but you could end up uh, with a pretty deadly scenario. So we want to get people to slow down for that. School zones, um, active areas, uh, potentially where roads cross with bicycle trails or, or uh, alternative use trails. Uh, those will all be great places where you want to get drivers to slow down. Uh, also where other enforcement and calming measures can be implemented. Kind of covered this already. I'm sorry, I got ahead of myself. Uh, so yeah, again, you can uh, place these signs alongside of law enforcement. And we'll kind of get into our, our offering later, but we have a trailer system. And so the trailer can be dropped off at a specific location. If you back that trailer up with a, a law enforcement, it doubles its effectiveness and they're, they're highly effective at getting drivers to slow down together. All right, and then the last one has a long uh, <laughs> summary of what a typical call we get uh, on a daily basis is someone who calls in from a homeowners association and they're, they're just mad that people are going fast through their neighborhood. We get this call a lot and we get a lot of traffic on our website from people that just are tired of people driving by their house so fast. And these are a great application for that. In fact, a lot of times they'll put the sign up and realize that people aren't going as fast as they thought they were. It just appears like they're going really fast but it's still effective at gathering that data and slowing down the drivers that, that will heed the warning. So residential areas, uh, especially to answer the request of concerned citizens. We see a lot of homeowners now potentially purchasing these signs. I know that doesn't really apply to this crowd here, but, <laughs> but it's interesting that there are people who will actually put these up in their own lawn on a, like a temporary basis or a, uh, like a portable basis um, and invest it in the, with their own dollars. So that's that's kind of cool. We basically have so okay. So we've decided we want a driver feedback. We have a great application for one. Now what do you buy? So at Traffic Calm we sell basically three types of driver feedback sign. There's our advanced sign, our basic sign, and then our portable solutions. So an advanced sign has some uh, large benefits over the basic systems. So the big one's going to be collect and report speed stats. So you don't get that with the the uh, basic systems that's only on the advanced um, products but you also get a dynamic display to drivers so you can use we, we actually have emojis built on the sign so a happy face a sad face uh, the message slow down and the message too fast can all be utilized to get drivers attention that's what it's all about is just getting drivers to recognize that they are uh, you know, moving too fast and whatever means necessary to get them to slow down. So a lot of times the sad face while kind of comical actually does work. It provides something to the brain that says, you know, this is, this is happening. What is that? What am I supposed to be doing? Oh, okay. And then it'll alternate that, that message, whatever the message may be with their actual speed. So that's one of the big functionalities of these signs. It has to show their actual speed in contrast with what they're supposed to be doing. So Usually we pair this with a static speed limit sign. So a regular old METCD uh, R5-1 or speed limit sign is gonna be complementing this, this uh, driver feedback sign to show drivers what their actual speed should be and then what their speed is. Uh, we have a suite of uh, configuration and setup uh, utilities here. I'll, sh I'll show you an actual live demo of that in a minute. Uh, to, to nail down exactly what this sign should be showing to drivers and how it's collecting data. We have a lot of flexibility in how the system functions and a full, like I said, a full software based on, oh, push the button again, <laughs> uh, based on an Android or Windows PC, Android phone or Windows PC, you can log into the sign and uh, configure the parameters and there's a lot of them. We offer a variety of sizes for different speed expectations. So basically how fast do you expect the drivers to be going on the roadway? Sometimes we just say, okay, your roadway is supposed to be a 35 mile an hour roadway. Here's the sign you want to use. But we offer, we always measure our displays and all of our, pretty much the industry standard is to measure the display height, not the overall sign height, because the overall sign heights vary from manufacturer to manufacturer, but the display height's very consistent. So we offer a nine inch, 12 inch, 15 inch and 18 inch display height. And you can imagine, the visibility increases as you increase in sign size. So a nine inch sign applies to a 25 mile an hour roadway, 
a 12 inch sign applies to say 35, maybe as much as 45 mile an hour roadway, 15 pretty much piles in at that 45 mile an hour uh, speed limit. And then 18 inch signs work for everything above 45. Um, they have about a thousand foot of range on their radars and visibility. So they can be utilized in high speed applications uh, with a lot of advanced warning. Uh, we do offer remote connectivity. Uh, you do want to be able to select from solar, AC, or battery operated, and I'll kind of talk about the solar especially in a minute, but, you know, we have variability in how these systems can be powered, which is great. You know, you can put, put a driver feedback sign pretty much anywhere. Uh, we've had them in Alaska running on exclusively battery power, so, you know, in, in the lower 48, you're going to get a great application pretty much across the board with solar or AC, AC especially if available, you know, it guarantees that operation, but uh, solar works pretty much everywhere. But they do, the, the advanced signs do require a more technical approach. So you have to be able to log into the sign with a computer or phone. You have to be able to configure it and understand what those configurations do. And then really to get the most out of the system, you have to be able to acquire that data and view the data. So, um, you know, you do wanna, if, you, if, if your installation team or your, we'll call them uh, after install team aren't very technical, I would go with more of the basic system. So the basic has a no frills installation, really the batteries integrated in the sign itself. You put the solar panel and the sign on the post with four bolts and you're ready to go. You power, uh, well, and then you have to power it on and do a really simple three, uh, three data point configuration. It's on site. So these don't offer remote access. They don't offer data collection and they don't offer the dynamic messaging. All they do is flash. So these are great for homeowners associations for small residential areas. Um, they're, they're effective. We've proven their effectiveness by observation, um, but they only offer that, that flashy measure. So as a, so you set the speed limit of the, the roadway in the sign, you set the minimum speed and the maximum speed. And essentially what happens is it'll, uh, it'll start flashing at that speed limit. So anybody exceeding the speed limit is going to get a flash display, hopefully prompting them to reduce their speed to at the, or below the speed limit. Uh, they are a smaller size, so we only offer these in 9 and 12 inch sizes, which is great. Uh, you know, most of the roadways that these are going to be effective on are not going to need any more than a 12 inch display or exceed that 35 mile per hour zone. And I said the, the owner of this is going to have low tech aspirations. So a lot of times the, the customer will call in and say they really don't want anything too hard to use. They don't want anything that's going to occupy all, all their days, you know, trying to get it to work. Uh, this is the system for them. I'm going to check the chat console here real quick and make sure I'm not missing anybody's requests. Okay, I think we're good. Again, if you do have any questions, feel free to just uh, send me a message there and, and I'll be sure to answer it. Okay, so the portable signs, um, we offer a lot of portable uh, options. So generally a portable sign is going to be based in our basic series, but it could also be our value series. And what a portable sign means is it can be moved from post to post or location to location. Um, they offer like a quick disconnect mounting or mobility on a trailer or a dolly. So we do offer solar portable signs, but they have a really compact, easy to use uh, solar panel that, that just, like I said, quickly disconnects all the brackets, quick disconnect. So usually what we recommend is that there's a bracket purchase for each post, a really inexpensive bracket, and you move the sign from bracket to bracket. Uh, again, really easy to use, really like one bolt removal. So you can get it off the post and, and moved around with removing one bolt. And they weigh about 35 pounds, so you're not going to, you know, stress too many people out. I mean, you do want to be aware that it is a large object that is heavy, but it's not overly heavy, especially for what it accomplishes. Or we do offer a dolly mounted sign or a trailer mounted sign. Uh, again, you can move them, those from site to site. Uh, the, the dolly mounted sign is great for... Um, like, especially campuses, like school campuses or uh, like 
corporate campuses. Uh, they can move it around from parking lot to parking lot or roadway to roadway and get the effectiveness of the sign spread across multiple areas. So law enforcement love the trailers. We all know that we've seen them out on the roadway and they're really effective at targeting a speed uh, reduction campaign in a specific area. Uh, my last statement is, you know, these are, these are typically purchased by people who don't want to buy a sign for every application or every roadway where they want one of these signs. So they can, uh, they can buy one, you know, for, they can buy one sign and move it across, say, three or four zones on a regular basis. They do require attention, though. You have to charge those batteries. You're going to have to uh, make sure they're operating properly. You're going to have to configure them every time you move them from zone to zone. So there are benefits in having a permanently mounted advanced or basic sign, but the portables do offer flexibility uh, to move them around. And they offer a cost reduction in, like a, from a project scope. All right, so how do you choose these systems? Well, the first, uh, or rather, I got a series of questions here you can go through uh, to kind of drill in on which one is best for your project. So the first question is remote connection desirable or planned? I've got a slide about that in a second, but you know, do you want data collection? Is dynamic messaging important or do you want scheduling? If the answer is yes to any four of those questions, you have to go with the advanced sign. Also, there should be one more question here. Is the speed limit of the road in excess, in excess of 35 miles per hour? Uh, for those, then you're going to have to go with the advanced signs. And then finally, do you want it to move around or do you want to be able to move it from, from site to site? You'll want to go portable. All right, so uh, drilling into more of the specific components of the system and what you're going to get in the boxes as they arrive. Uh, the first thing is going to be, uh, you know, selecting a solar kit, you're going to get a solar kit. Uh, so why would we do that? Well, for starters, you uh, increase your act application variability, you decrease planning and permitting. Um, you generally don't have to fulfill UL requirements if you're utilizing solar because you're not connecting to AC power. There's a few UL uh, applications for the solar panels themselves and potentially the battery cabinet that you need to fulfill, but those are much, much uh, less tedious than, than AC power. And again, just the, the general application of solar is so much more versatile. You, you can put these, this picture I have here on the background I actually took in uh, Western Oregon in more or less what was uh, the Hood, Hood Mountain region. On both sides of the road, you have 30 foot trees, 40 foot trees <laughs> blocking the sun all day long. But the solar kit for this sign was sized appropriately so that it accounted for everything that could potentially go wrong out there, snow coverage, I mean, they have, you know, hundreds of inches of snow dumped on this area every year. Uh, and it still works all the way through the winter because it has sufficient battery power and sufficient solar panel. So the one thing is really important when you're going to uh, spec in or drive the purchase of a, a driver feedback sign based on solar is to get a solar report. Uh, a lot of people offer variations of these solar reports, but ours is fairly easy to use. And I'll pull one up here. I've got uh, ready to show. go okay hopefully you can see this so it is a it's a um, excel spreadsheet so pretty easy to use we use geisma weather data which is based on uh, nasa's data weather data use and there's just a couple simple questions that we answer here in the red and then to the left of that there are all these parameters now you don't have to come up with these parameters themselves yourself these three row or uh yeah, rows here are the Geisman weather data. And basically what we're trying to do is prove what the worst month is that this sign is gonna be exposed to. So we don't really care about the other 11 months out of the year, because if it works in the worst month, it's gonna work in the 11 better months. So this was based on uh, Washington DC's weather data. You plug in, I'm sorry, you plug in the proposed latitude, uh, you select which sign you wanna utilize. So there's a full, uh, not working too great here in the presentation but a full list of signs that you can select from, all of the traffic home signs. Uh, the expected daily traffic can be calculated either by plugging in a, uh, a number here, which adjusts it, or you can just plug in the direct, if you know the average daily traffic, you can just plug that in right there. Uh, <laughs> There we go. <laughs> All right, 
So you got your average daily traffic because that really has a lot to do with how long the sign's flashing for. And the biggest current draw on the signs is the display. So if the display is only going to be showing for a few minutes a day, that makes a huge difference in how much solar we apply to the system. If it's going to be flashing 24 seven, we need to know that so that we can apply the right amount of solar power. We also want to know the posted speed limit so that we can know how long in advance the driver is going to be detected and for how long they will be showing their sign their display. So we take the, the average detection range of the sign and we're able to calculate uh, how long a driver going 25 miles per hour is going to be showing that display. Within reason, we've got like variability to all this to make sure that it pops out the right solar kit and the right data. And then we want to plug in the minimum autonomy. Now, usually we shoot for seven days, one week of autonomy. Autonomy, if you're not familiar with the term, is how long the sign will run for without any solar influence at all. This is just strictly running on battery power. Um, so with, with that in mind, we plug in how many days we want the sign to be running on exclusively battery power. Now, generally, you're not going to see more than a week without some sunlight. But that being said, you're not going to, you may have several weeks where you don't have great sunlight. So we can kind of balance this autonomy number somewhere around seven to 15 to even 30 days. But do know as you change this number, the solar power goes up. So you need more and more and more as you plug in more days here. Now, once that's all completed, uh, there's an output that automatically populates and it shows you exactly which solar kit we're proposing, like this SLR1400C. So that would be a 140 amp hour battery with a 100 watt solar panel. It's sufficient to operate a 15 inch sign off of in Washington DC based on the weather data given. But it goes into greater detail about specifically how long is that system gonna run for? What kind of power are you producing? So like here, uh, we want a minimum panel to load ratio. So that's the energy that is produced versus the energy consumed needs to be at least 120%. So every day we need to produce 20% more um, power than we consume to ensure that the system operates uh, 365 days a year, 24 seven. Now in this scenario, we're producing 2.0 times the amount of uh, power than what we need, but that's intentional the 1.2 is a static figure that's the, what we the minimum we want to see but based on the worst data worst month's data we actually want to see a 2.0 um ratio of panel uh, solar panel production and that's what we're getting here so you get a this number right here this 13 watt hours is how many excess watts watt hours you get produced in a day which is great and the reason is that some days, if you're not going to produce any light, then you don't have that excess or you actually dip into your uh, consumption more deeply. So now the next day you have to produce, let's say, twice as much or three times as much. So this system can perform those duties uh, sufficiently and make sure that the sign works permanently. We see a lot of times these signs, not our solar, solar kits in general, We'll have insufficient battery. So the batteries themselves will be depleted on a regular basis. And that really sucks the energy out of the battery and can kill a battery pretty quick. So we wanna provide signs that you're gonna get about three to five years of use out of the batteries included, cause they're not cheap, you know, they're not expensive, but they're not, they're not like you just go down to Walmart and buy a couple AA batteries and you're good to go. Uh, these are like automotive level batteries. And in some instances there's four of them. And in, in this case, in fact, there's four batteries in there. So the, the maintenance cost could be substantial if you're replacing those batteries on an annual basis. So we wanna ensure that they're getting, an ex the customer's getting a quality use out of those batteries as they would expect. So. We provide a little more battery power and a little more solar power to make sure those batteries don't drain down too low. And it just provides a better use experience for the customer. Uh, that's one thing we really strive for at Traffic Calm is getting repeat customers, satisfied customers or re can be repeat customers. And that's one thing that we really want to see happen with our driver feedback signs. And I'm sure uh, Ocean State would, would mirror that, that sentiment. Um, yeah, so this is a full report. It has a couple charts in it that show, you know, what's going to happen throughout the year. So monthly insulation is how much power is produced in the, any given month. So as expected, you're going to see January be the lowest production, or rather in this case, <laughs> December is the lowest production for Washington, D.C. Obviously, if you put these down in Santiago, Chile, you would have an opposite uh, chart. It would be uh, upside down bell curve. And then we look at the monthly temperature, which obviously correlates directly to 
the production of um, power. So those are just some summaries there. This uh, also includes the specifications for any given solar uh, supply and a summary of what we're talking about. So that's our solar um, report. And you really wanna see one of those before you invest in a solar kit for your, your sign. All right, so remote connection. So we have integrated our systems with applied information's add-on uh, remote connection device. And that integrates in with Glance online software. So it's you know cloud-based. So you can go out on any computer, log into your Glance system and view all the information on the driver feedback signs connected, as well as uh, configure them remotely, which is awesome. Uh, you can do everything you could do roadside with a driver feedback sign from any computer in the world. Obviously, it's highly secure, and they've gone to great lengths to make sure that it can't be hacked. I don't know why you'd want to hack a sign that can only show a happy face, sad face, or somebody's speed, but potentially it's out there, right? So it's highly secure, but it also integrates in with other systems out on the roadway that AI has been applied to. So that could be uh, school zone flashers or a curve warning system or a wrong way warning system. There's a, a, a whole catalog of, of um applications that applied information has uh, expanded to and our driver feedback is included in those so it is an added cost but it provides something that a lot of customers in 2020 are looking for which is that remote connectivity and it's cool because you can do what edmonton has done edmonton they use the city of edmonton used the local college to to build their system out with and their own modems and all that which was in a very expensive endeavor ai's taken all that and and made it uh, modular and and approachable really easy to use, highly supported by, by AI. And uh, I believe Ocean State can, can uh, supply the, the AI integration at a moment's notice. The installation of our systems, um, you've got basically two installation processes depending on the sign uh, you've selected. So our nine and 12 inch sign mount as you see on the left here. And then our 15 and 18 inch signs mount as you see on the right. Uh, they're integrated to be able to accept either bolting or banding and as easy installation as possible. So the ones that have the integrated brackets on the chassis, the electronics actually slide out during the installation process so that they're kept safe and secure off the side of the, on the truck bed or on the side of the road or whatever. You mount the whole structure to the post and then you slide in the electronics module. Whereas the 9 and 12 inch sign, you have a basic bracket. That's what you see on the left side of that picture. There is the bracket removed. That bracket mounts to your polar post or wall, or we've even had people mount these hanging from ceilings uh, in production facilities. Uh, that portion is really lightweight, just an aluminum U-channel mounts to whatever, and then you slide the sign on and put one bolt in and it's all assembled. Uh, here's a detail of showing the banding or the bracketing of a nine or 12 inch sign. This is pretty typical. That's why I'm showing it here is, you know, this is gonna be what most customers are, are confronted with out in, out in the field or most installers are. So this is how you do that. And you can, uh, this presentation will be available after the fact and uh, you can show, you know, whomever this picture so they can get a good idea of what they're, what they're dealing with. All right, your connections. We've made sure that all of our connections are labeled properly. They're extremely easy to connect. You can't really get them wrong. Uh, unless you disconnect something, I've seen a lot of customers, they go and they disconnect all of the, the pigtails that we've, we've put in place to make it easy to connect, then that's a service call because they've, they've kind of mixed things up. But as long as you take it out of the box and leave it as is, uh, it's ready to, to connect uh, to any of our power supplies. So AC or solar or the battery supplies, uh, you're going to have, like I said, quick disconnects. Uh, but, you know, solid for road use, right? They're not going to fall apart. They're going to have positive connections that, that lock in once you've connected them. But uh, really easy to accomplish. So no concerns there, no anxieties there. Solar panels are easy to connect. Most of them come pre-wired, so you're not actually digging through the solar panel junction box to connect the, the, the cable. You're going to be uh, just routing a wire through conduit into the sign, and you're good to go. All right, so how do we configure these signs? Well, you're going to need a Windows PC or an Android phone or tablet. Uh, we don't, we're not compatible with uh, Apple products. Um, it's just uh, their, their Bluetooth is too complicated to work with. So we're stuck with Android and, and Windows PC. 
Uh, you need somebody out there to configure it unless you've gone the AI route, right? Like if you've gone AI, then you power the system on, somebody installs it, powers it on, and then an engineer in their office can go in and, and configure the sign. But uh, you will need somebody out roadside if you haven't gone that route. And we connect to the signs with Bluetooth. It's really simple. It's no uh, proprietary connection. You don't need a dongle or anything unless you don't have Bluetooth built into your device. But generally, um, you're going to be the installer is going to be on their phone or their tablet configuring this system, and those all have Bluetooth. They're short range Bluetooth, so you do have to stand fairly close to the sign. We've had some. In fact, I overheard my uh, support personnel yesterday on a conversation. The guy was just too far away from his sign to be able to configure it. He had to get closer. And once he got closer, everything was really cake, but he was, you know, just didn't know that. That's in all of our manuals and stuff though, but you could pass that, <laughs> that along to whoever's installing the system. Also, while you have your phone out, you might as well go and uh, check out uh, Ocean State and Traffic Calm on social media. We're all over the place and we sure would appreciate uh, for you to like us and subscribe to our content. All right, so the configuration the screen you see at left here is what you would see in um, on an Android device. And basically you log into the sign, you pair your Bluetooth, you log into the sign with a proprietary password. So it's really, we, we keep that password pretty close so that no, so you can't just have kids out on the street, download our soft, our app and go and change the signs. We keep it close. It's in the manual and it's uh, very rarely in presentations such as this but never published online or uh, in, in a public forum. So the first screen you're met with when you log into the sign is the sign info. And that just shows you all the parameters of the sign. This is how you know you've successfully connected to that specific sign. And you see, we've got a lot of uh, data coming off the sign, whether it's the brightness level, because we're monitoring the active brightness of the roadway. And what that does, the brightness level or the brightness detection automatically dims the display for active light or ambient light. So that's really cool. Uh, you got your voltages, your temperature ex that the system is exposed to. Keep in mind, all this stuff is available remotely if you're uh, working with the AI system. So you don't need to be out on site for that again. Uh, you get this kind of data. It's manifest differently in the different formats. So this is the Android app. It's nice and clean. It's really easy to use. The, uh, the, the desktop app or the PC app, app is a little more complex needfully so because it does a few more things and then the the ai cloud integration is different in itself but all the the content is the same right all right so just know i'm gonna kind of speed through some things here but just know there are four speed thresholds on the sign this is speaking to the the advanced signs the basic signs again you only have really basic rudimentary setups so this is exclusively for the advanced signs uh, you've got three speed speed thresholds uh, or I'm sorry, four speed thresholds, the minimum speed, the speed limit, the excess speed and the maximum speed. And each of those thresholds, you set what the driver sees as they cross over that threshold in their speed. So if the speed limit's 45 and they're going 57, well, maybe that's the excess point. We can actually shut the sign off and not show them their speed above that speed. That's called the, uh, the excess speed shut off. And basically it displays the message too fast. It won't show them their speed anymore. And the idea behind that is that a lot of people, not a lot of people, I'm sorry, that people that are exceeding the speed limit by that much are doing it intentionally and may even think it's funny that the sign's showing them their, their excess speed. So we cut them off. We don't want to do that. We just show them the message too fast or a blank display. Uh, generally, what you're going to see is the, the speed limit and the excess speed used in conjunction uh, to, to elevate the warning. I'm sorry, I just referred to the, the excess speed or the maximum speed is the excess speed. So the maximum speed is when it cuts off. But you have a second threshold between the speed limit and the cutoff speed called the excess speed. And that elevates the warning to driver. So this may go from a uh, blinking display to a rapidly flashing display, depending on what you can use, or even that sad face emoji. Um, we can just set up the parameters so that you get an increased warning to drivers as they go excessively over the speed limit. Generally, we set the excess speed to about what an officer would write a ticket at. So that's somewhere between five and 10 miles an hour over the posted speed limit. So, uh, you know, once somebody exceeds that threshold, they're gonna see hopefully this, this uh, more rapidly flashing display. One thing we've seen a lot of application of as it's become available is enhancing the system with uh, exterior flashers. Uh, so we ourselves sell a 
a flasher ring uh, that can be mounted to the speed limit sign or the, the driver feedback sign itself. And that would only, act, that we can select when to activate that, that ring. Uh, we've also seen uh, driver feedback signs used in conjunction with beacons to accelerate the warning or, or, or improve the warning. I also have some general settings that you should be aware of. Uh, stealth mode shuts the sign down. And this one's really critical for, for speed studies. It shuts the display down, but keeps the radar running. So you're still collecting data. So we can actually alternate using the schedules, alternate uh, between normal mode and stealth mode and get uh, a variation of when the sign is on compared to when it's off. How is it functioning over, let's say a 24 hour period or a three week period or whatever. Uh, so that's really critical. I think the sign should absolutely have that, especially if you're using it for data collection. Um, and really critical in school zones. So you can set the display off during non-school zone hours, but you continue to collect data in that school zone for when the school zone's off, you know, or when, when, when there are no children present. It's kind of a cool feature that lets you know, okay, when I shut this sign off, I'm getting these massive speeds that, that I wasn't getting when, when the sign was on. And that's a lot of times we do see that. We also have a brightness offset. So you want to be able to adjust the brightness of the display. Uh, it will still adjust itself automatically on ambient light, but you do need to be able to uh, show or, you know, adjust the brightness even beyond that. So it doesn't override it. It works with it. So if you want the sign to be brighter, it'll still be brighter day and night, but it won't be the same brightness 24 seven. It, it still adjusts itself. The squelch setting is the sensitivity of the radar. And this is a big one because the radar uh, is not going to work in 100% of applications right out of the box as perfect as it will most of the time. So we have a squelch setting that allows you to adjust the value of the radar sensitivity uh, to a specific roadway. So you can observe the functionality of the radar once the sign's installed and adjust the squelch so that it has really clean uh, detections. Normally that's not a problem if all you're doing is showing drivers their speeds, but if you're using the data collection on the sign, you want really clean detection and the squelch helps you uh, dial in that, that clean detection. All right, and finally, you can set your units from miles per hour to kilometers per hour. There's a lot of other settings in the sign, but I'm just not going to get into those right now because it's, you know, just for time's sake. In fact, we're kind of, kind of running short on time here. So I'll just show you briefly what the, the software looks like. Here it is uh, on, in the Windows version. So you get a readout once you log into the sign using the secure password. Uh, again, we've paired with Bluetooth, we've logged in, and we've arrived at this screen. And there's a lot of parameters here. So you've got your speed settings and you can't change any of these. So the, the one thing, the one tip I'll give here is that if you're going to configure the sign, you go into edit and then configurations, it opens a very similar window. In fact, you probably didn't even notice the difference, but now you can go through and change all your speed settings. So starting at the max speed, two, you can work your way back and you can set for each speed threshold. Again, you have your fourth speed thresholds, minimum speed, speed limit, excess speed, and maximum speed. You can set what happens on the display over here to the left of the, uh, to the right of those, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, the important thing here is to note that you can turn the beacon on or off. A beacon is an externally connected device, whether that's a sign ring, a flashing sign, a beacon, a camera, uh, there's, there's variability there in what we can shut off as an external device. Basically what we provide is a switch that can shut on, it's a powered switch. So it has a, a 10 watt output that can sh power and shut on or off an external device. Now we also have your, your strobe modes, which are where you can select the happy face or sad face selection for any given speed threshold. So to let's say at the minimum speed, people going under the speed limit. So people going, between a certain speed, usually like 10 miles an hour, 15 miles an hour, and the speed limit, so let's say 35, we could show them a happy face. So we're not sad that they're going over the speed limit. In fact, we're rewarding them for going under the speed limit. Once we're done with that, we just send those configurations to the sign, or that configuration to the sign, and it sets it. I'm not connected to a sign right now, so a lot of this is not populated, so just bear that in mind. But that is the software there. All right, so one thing a lot of people are always interested in is how to retrieve the speed logs from the system. Now on the Android app, we have a full guide for this. On the Android app, you can retrieve the speed logs, but you can't view them on your phone. That's not, uh, it's not functional, but you can retrieve them, save them and email them to yourself off your device and then go and view them on any desktop computer or, win or any Windows computer running our software. So our, 
Our speed report is integrated into our configuration software and you're offered uh, six speed logs um, that show the data broken up into various useful data sets. So one thing to note about our signs is they collect the highest and lowest speed of every driver. So if somebody drives, approaches the sign at 45 miles an hour and slows to 35, you're gonna get those two uh, speeds recorded. Um, and so all of our reports are based on, we have these two data sets, the lowest speed of every driver and the highest speed of every driver. And what we wanna see is a reduction from people's highest speeds to their lowest speeds. And there's a lot of information here, which I will show you in a demo real quick. There we go. So we're back in the software again, but we're working offline. We go to view log file and I've got one pulled up here, but uh, you can save these anywhere. This is a real file from 2013, so a little bit aged out, but it's still the same information you would see from a sign today. I'm opening it, I've got, oh, about 30 days worth of data here. You can see it's well populated, but for the sake of visibility, usually we, we wanna look at just a few days worth of data to give a uh, better a better view of what's going on out there. So here's the first screen you see is the highest speed summary report. So this is the highest speed of all drivers approaching the sign. Uh, we had a total number of 641 vehicles. Their average speed was 22 miles per hour in a 15 mile per hour zone. So, uh, you know, this is a really hard number to hit this 15 miles per hour. So most drivers were going over 22. In fact, the 85th percentile was, was 28 uh, miles per hour there. So not a great uh, display of what, what was going on out on this roadway, but we have Every 15 minutes, we, we lump the, or bin the data into 10 speed, uh, speed bins, but that's not really relevant, uh, except for this number at the bottom where 294 of the 641 drivers were going above 23 miles per hour at their highest speed. Now, if we look at the lowest speed summary report, that number has now reduced to 168 and the average speed is now 19. That means that all the drivers reduce their speeds on average by three miles per hour. So 641 drivers uh, of those, we, re we realized uh, an average speed reduction and uh, the sign would be considered successful in this zone. We also have this chart that shows the speeding distribution. This is really useful to law enforcement. It is important to note that it is two charts in one. So you've got your highest speed in red and lowest speeds in blue. And we can see where most drivers are spending most of their time when they're, when they're approaching the sign. So in this case, uh, almost everybody, 45% of the volume is above 23 miles per hour. <laughs> uh, we also have speeding vehicles. This is a little populated here. We probably wanna look at less data or a shorter data set to get a better visibility here, but we can tell by time of day, uh, the volume and percent of drivers that were speeding or going above the posted speed limit. I say posted, but I actually mean the, the set speed limit. I don't know what the posted speed limit of this sign was, but I assume it was 15 because that's what the customer set it to. But you could technically set it to whatever you want to. We also have the average speed of all vehicles based on time of day. So you can uh, provide this to law enforcement and they can correlate, okay, at this specific time of day. Again, this is a little bit, um, there's not a great visibility in here, but if I was looking at this time frame where a lot of people are going pretty fast or the, the average speed was pretty high here in this time of day, I would go and look at this data set from 820 at uh, 1 p.m. to 820 at 120. So it's like a pretty sh short window, but uh, yeah, you can see, you know, we'd wanna put law enforcement out there at this time of day. Sometimes this is more dramatic, especially in places where there's uh, daily traffic. These, these will drop because speeds reduce in traffic. Uh, so it gives, law enforcement a valuable data set, and then your 85th percentile report. And this is split up by highest and lowest speed sum, summations again. So that's the data that we provide. Um, take note of the six reports that we do provide and that uh, there are two data sets recorded. All right, so I'm gonna open up to any questions here. Please use the chat console or the question and answer uh, section. I'd be happy to answer anything that you've got got questions about there.
you know, we've been in this industry for a long time. We've pretty much seen it all. <laughs> and uh, we really love to pass along the information that we have um, gained over the last 10 years of, of working with these signs. Here's our contact information. That's Ocean State at the top there. You can contact them. They're really knowledgeable in our driver feedback products. And then Mike, or uh, Bob is, is the Northeast Regional Sales Manager there for Traffic Calm. You can get a hold of him as well and get more information um, on driver feedback from him. Yeah, I've got a question here. I uh, asked quite a, or yeah. Uh, it was asked if our signs have highway Gothic font. So our signs are the only ones that display in the highway Gothic font. Um, they render the characters as best they can in highway Gothic. In fact, this picture you see here on the display is actually our old seven segment system. It was just a great picture, <laughs> but our new systems are full matrix. So our advanced systems are full matrix and they render in a, a highway Gothic font, which is important because it is highly visible. We've, you know, that the visibility of that font is, is very proven and it actually extends the visibility of our signs because we render in that font, but we're the only ones that do it. So you're not going to see that on any other driver feedback sign in the industry. All right, any other questions? If not, I, I uh, thank you for your time and thank uh, Ocean State for giving us this opportunity. Really appreciate uh, being able to reach out to the customer base out there and show them what we're, what we're offering. Thanks a lot, everybody.